Hello there, all. Welcome to the secret history living inside your aquarium. Today we're going to talk about an incredible woman who really, really is the one who invented the aquarium, at least in the way we know it today. So, who is this woman? What's her name? Where did she come from? What's she about? And what other interesting things can we dig up? It's really an incredible story, um, both for the time and even for nowadays, for someone to be such a renaissance uh, woman in this case. Um, so very interesting story. So let's jump right in. First of all, her name was Jean Villapoule Powell, and she was born in 1794 in Juliac, France. And she was born to a relatively poor family, seamstress and uh, shoe cobblers, uh, as well as seasonal farm work and things like that in her life. At the age of 18, she runs away to Paris and decides that she wants to be a dressmaker. So she kind of favors up gets herself involved with the royal family and becomes buddy-buddy with them, meets Princess Caroline, who is the nephew of Louis the Eighteenth, around uh, 1816 or so, and she says, I will make you a dress, and she makes her a dress, which is just really pretty amazing with the French Revolution just having gone on and uh, the monarchy being... Uh, murdered and all these thing, terrible things back and forth and then Napoleon and it's just a time of great turmoil. If you haven't read about the French Revolution and Enlightenment period, uh, it's very, very fascinating. It's also where a lot of our democracy and uh, Western quote-unquote values and government have stemmed from between that and uh, Roman rule way back in ancient times. So, that's not for this video. This is an aquarium and uh, aquatic-based video. So, she meets the royal family, made this dress scene in this uh, portrait here. Here's another very flowing, interesting dress, you know, um, of the time. So, soon after making the dress, she... You can't really see this one, I'm sorry. We'll zoom in a little bit. But, this is Sic Sicily... Uh, Cecilia is known by uh, the locals, but she left after marrying a well-to-do uh, merchant and trader that was in the royal family's inner circle, and her and her husband moved to Sicily. Uh, as I said, it was a time of turmoil, and there was a lot of uncertainty of what was going to happen in in France with the royal family and things like that. She wasn't royalty, as I said, so it was kind of an odd change to go from uh, basically peasant to into the inner circle, one step away from royalty, and then all of a sudden uh, now she's married, and at the age of 18 she was making dresses for the royal family, She's just a very intelligent woman. She wanted to attend universities, and the French Revolution had just empowered women pretty greatly compared to the way they were before. Women were allowed to make many critical decisions, play roles in government, things like that, um, that before were kind of unheard of, uh, especially throughout the European world. So she meets this man, He's sent away to Sicily for business reasons, and she settles in there and decides that she's going to become a naturalist. So she brings with her many, many books, and this this is sometime after. So in 1816, that's when she first made a dress for Princess Caroline, and around 1825 or so, she's been doing this a while, she's married, she's living in Paris, and she's has excess time and obligations uh, socially 
as many aristocratic folks would, and so she's rubbing shoulders with people from Germany and people from London and people from uh, Belgium, all over the world, Americans that are scientists and social aristocrats and thinkers and composers and all sorts of interesting people. And Paris is really one of the only places in the world at the time where women could in some way or another participate with with that in a in a meaningful way and so she uh, uh, during this time she falls really really in love with uh, shells and she becomes fascinated with shells and so she is deciding how do you how do you go get shells what is the way to go get shells and at the time it was either free diving or diving bells which were these dangerous contraptions uh, where they lowered you to the sea floor, you had a basket, there was air trapped in there, and then sometimes they had a guy pumping air to another guy on the floor, and there are all sorts of crazy contraptions that were just dangerous that they uh, had been around a long time, but that they had be, been using more during this period. So they come up with these diving bells and bring up living nautilus and mussels and clams and she's very fascinated by what they're bringing in from the shorelines and bringing into paris in the way of uh high-end food and things like that and she's also fallen in love with being a naturalist and taking notes and drawing and so she begins to document these uh cephalopods everything from cuttlefish to octopus to nautilus and then all of a sudden, as I said, they moved to Sicily. Sicily has a great uh, history of fishing and exploration and trading and all sorts of things where the water is really their highway. There's lots of free divers for all sorts of food and shells. Um, there's pigments they extract from shells. There's calcium, all sorts of things. So... She gets in touch with this community. There's another picture here of a diving bell. Let me zoom back out. Uh, this is actually a uh, an American version of the diving bell a little later on. Um, but it's almost like this sci-fi, like, that doesn't work. Kind of, you kind of get this feeling about it. But she becomes really interested in, in the mechanics of all this, and she decides that, uh, as you can see on figure C, they're lowering buckets, she says, "Well, I really want to study these animals in these shells that I've been that, that are brought to me and put in formaldehyde, or they die quickly. Um, I want to study them down underwater." And so they come up with essentially a glass diving bell that they push the air out of, and they can lower it down onto the floor of the ocean. And this isn't in deep water; this no more than 20 feet or so. And the first experiments were done, you know, in three or four feet of water. But she gets these glass containers made uh, that look kind of like antique aquariums or uh, shipping crates made out of glass, made out of a, a very sturdy glass. And at the time, it wasn't necessarily the most clear, but it was clear enough that she could study these animals. And she... Uh, first really, really got into studying uh, both octopus and nautilus. And she actually, while there, documented the first ever use of tools by an octopus. And so she uh, set up experiments in this little clear glass cage, which she put underwater, and then she would either swim down and take observations, or from a diving bell, someone could take observations. And basically they decided this was just too hard, too labor intensive, let's bring it up. And so they created these pools, like tide pools basically, where they could study and look from above, but she really needed that side profile. So they started building uh, large open scale aquariums by what we would think of them today as observation points. And through these observation points, she also figured out that the uh, Argonauta, Argonautilus, 
which is the Latin name of the uh, paper nautilus, that it creates its shell in a specific pattern and way, and then when it has damages, it can actually heal those damages. And so she's studying this nautilus, she's doing amazing illustrations, and you know, here's a specimen that traditionally they're studied and they're in these glass jars formaldehyde. They're not living, they're more of specimens brought back from uh, colonial and imperial uh, travels around the globe, and she is most interested in their behavior. So she's drawing from what she's observing underwater, and she becomes uh, an accomplished illustrator as well as working with other local illustrators and through correspondence she's building up ties specifically in uh, Berlin, Paris, and Brussels and then London. Obviously London being a large hub for scientific and uh, zoological uh, marine based research all of that uh, it becomes the hub for all of that. And so she's writing back and forth and not necessarily even disclosing that she's a woman in some cases. So she's able to get into these inner circles through correspondence and was really seen as the foremost expert in cephalopods. Also, she studied mussels and uh, clams, bivalves, things like that. And later on, she really wanted to study them in her house, in her seaside house. So they figured out how to create a very rudimentary like this aquarium. This is a woodcut from the period. And this is the first aquarium. In 1832, as far as we know, uh, that's the first aquarium used to study marine life uh, and designed to hold living creatures prolonged amounts of time in a glass fixture. There were ponds and things obviously before this, but this is the first mention of it and she was the one responsible for the idea and she she basically built three kinds of aquariums. One was that early kind that went down with a diving bell or a diver or a free diver and that was on the sea floor in a crate. The other one was basically a, a type that you would put down in a tide pool and you could watch it certain times a day and you can kind of observe it and go down and snorkel and look at it in very shallow waters and it was more of just a pond with one side that was glass but really the one that she'll be remembered for is obviously this one which is very very similar to the aquariums we know today now they had a little bit of trouble keeping things alive at times but they realized they needed to bring in all of the substrates the gravel the rocks the animals and that there was an ecosystem here and she writes extremely detailed on all of this and all of this is being shared with people throughout europe and in england people are thinking about, well, we should set this up where uh, other people can see it, you know, and we'll bring back uh, treasures from all over the empire, Paris and Munich and Berlin and Brussels, London, Madrid, Milan, all these places have uh, an urge by the, the 1850s to, to really do this. Now, she's 20 years earlier than that. This is 1832. And in 1839, she publishes her first real book or treatise, which is, it's in French, but it's the Physical Observations and Experiments on Marine Living and Terrestrial Living Animals, is what it translates to. And that was a, a pretty groundbreaking paper. It talked about the mathematics and the geometry of the Nautilus, as well as the intelligence of octopi as well as starfish and regeneration of limbs and uh, larval stages, how things mate. I mean, her, her discoveries were years and years ahead of anybody else in the field. And she was recognized for it. She, she was by her fellow uh, naturalists around the Western world. So in 1842, 
she publishes, still living in Sicily, the Gidia per la Sicilia, which is the uh, Aquafilia Guide uh, to S uh, Sicily. And she was dubbed later on by Richard Owen, who uh, helped found the Natural History Museum in Britain, uh, and the London Aquarius Society and Zoological Society, all these famous institutions. Uh, he called her the uh, mother or the princess or queen in different uh, publications of aquafilia, which is uh, essentially uh, the aquarium hobby at the time. And it was, it was constrained mostly to wealthy folks and naturalists, but interesting nonetheless you re you recognize your aquarium this this is where the roots come from from this incredibly brilliant woman so here's the cover of her her writings they were printed later on um, unfortunately she leaves Sicily uh, in 1844 and all of her life's work is on board the ship and it sinks while going to London when she's about to give a talk and go stay in London for a time with her husband. And she loses everything, falls into a terrible depression, and says she's never going to work again in the sciences. Gradually, she becomes a guest speaker and gets interested in the uh, royal museums and aquariums of Europe. Uh, this is the Natural History Museum in uh, the UK, in London. Actually, I don't know if it's in London. Uh, somebody in the UK can tell me that. But uh, ginormous building, one of the first museums that was really open to the public. Plus, there was one in, in Paris at the same time, and an aquarium in Paris at the same time. Uh, in the 1850s, aquariums start to open all over Europe. And although the animals die rather quickly, and there's a lot of kinks to work out, this is really the roots of it. And by the turn of the century, not just little garamis or paradise fish or things like that coming back from Southeast Asia in the tropics, uh, not just they are kept in uh, tanks, but all sorts of uh, fish start to come in, and they start to learn about water uh the, the chemical properties of water and the biological properties of the living organisms. So I just wanted to share with you this woman's amazing story. Uh, this is kind of a caricature of a moving aquarium coming to town, you know, showing uh, the amazing life forms and things. Some of them are made up clearly in there, right? Um, Barnum and Bailey style, but there was this craze of aquariums in the 18, late 1850s and 60s in Europe. In the U.S., it was also starting, but then the Civil War happened, and that kind of protracted uh, the evolution of that. So I wanted to talk about women who have made great strides and really who founded the hobby. So a lot of people don't think that or know that about this incredible woman, uh, and I just wanted to say thank you, uh, Jean Villepoule Powell, and thank you to all the women out there in the hobby and the sciences for all your work. Uh, she has a crater on Venus named after her also, but I think we should give her a little more credit than uh, that. So if you like this, if you like these history videos, please like, subscribe, feel free to share, and... Uh, if you want to support me doing more of this, it takes time and research, I, there will be a link to my Patreon as well, and that, that really helps out. But uh, do what you can, and I totally understand 